or synthetic crystals, even gemstones, made. Which other products now are synthesized? Just what is synthesis, anyhow? Industry on Parade. Peabody Award winner for public service, produced on film each week by the National Association of Manufacturers. Into a gleaming vat filled with water goes a very special powder. The water is as pure as it's possible for water to be. The powder is a chemical that started out as coal, which was transformed first into coke, then calcium carbide, and then acetylene. Later, the acetylene was combined with additional chemicals under high temperature and pressure. The result of all this complicated chemical synthesis, the result is a synthetic plasma a substitute for the liquid portion of human blood. One of hundreds of synthetics now improving life for all of us. Synthesis is basically a matter of rearranging the atoms in the molecule. And this is a report on what industry is accomplishing through such rearranging, creating all sorts of things once made only by nature, plus some others that are completely new. Here, the project under discussion involves an improved synthetic cortisol, a drug used in the treatment of arthritis, among other diseases, and will make available plentifully a substance better than the cortisol derived from nature. From the theory of the problem, they know the drug they are after will do the work of cortisol without cortisol's dangerous side effects. Expert knowledge in many fields is applied to the project here at the Shearing Corporation in Bloomfield, New Jersey. As usual in the research efforts through which industry has achieved such progress in synthetics of all kinds, the work here turned out to be far from a one-man operation. Virtually all such developments are the result not of the experiments of a single researcher struggling alone, but of team effort involving scores, even hundreds of persons who may have to spend years on a project before reaching the culmination of their work. In this case, the research resulted in a compound that clinical tests revealed to be effective in the treatment of a number of diseases. They named it Metacortin and went on to tackle the additional problems involved in putting it into mass production at a cost low enough to make it widely useful. The mixed powders are dried for 24 hours to prepare them for further processing. And finally, on a battery of machines, the metacortin tablets are formed. High-speed, quantity manufacture of a drug that's actually an improvement on the cortisone that once required the glands of 20,000 head of cattle to make only a small handful of pills. Now, another industry and another problem in synthesis. Here at General Tire and Rubber Company in Akron, Ohio, research engineers worked long months to eliminate the basic faults of ordinary synthetic rubber, whose chief fault was that it was almost impossible to fabricate into tires and other products without losing strength in the process. So, revolutionary new techniques were tried. The result, a product that retained a strength and a method that yielded 22% more of the finished product than formerly was obtained from the same amount of raw materials. The laboratory demonstration we've been watching now has arrived at the final step. Blending with a coagulating solution of salt and acid, the material immediately becomes a homogeneous mass of tough, plasticized rubber. The electric stirrer assures that the entire mixture is exposed to the coagulating agent. When the stirrer is turned off, black synthetic crumb rubber rises to the surface. Produced in this fashion, but of course in much larger quantities, it's a synthetic that frees the nation from its long-time dependence on overseas rubber supplies.
Perhaps the most dramatic illustration of industrial progress in duplicating nature is the manufacture of gems. In these ovens in Chicago, Lindy Air Products Company literally grows star sapphires, starting with little sticks called seeds and using the intense heat of an oxygen-hydrogen flame. Sapphires are variations of that familiar element aluminum in combination with other elements. Knowing that, industrial researchers have found ways to produce the stones in factories for both ornamental and industrial use. Open, the oven doors reveal a synthesized sapphire. Not only sapphires, but even diamonds now are being manufactured. The diamonds of the size and quality used various industrial processes are a development of general electric research. Now being produced in quantity, they're another example of industrial research's success in freeing America from dependence on foreign sources. How are the diamonds made? Well, details remain a closely guarded trade secret, but it's known that the process is a result of research in high temperatures and pressures. And it's also known that the work is largely a controlled and vastly telescoped duplication of the processes with which nature herself creates diamonds. Not so secret is the method by which is manufactured another kind of crystal vital to national defense. First, a chemical solution is prepared from ammonium dehydrogen phosphate. Next, seed crystals are mounted in racks which will hold them in the solution for a two-month period of growth. Large to begin with, the size of the crystals will multiply many times during immersion. Control of the temperature in the tanks is the key factor, so insulating blankets are used to help the automatic controls gradually bring down the temperature at a pre-controlled rate. The big reason why large, perfect crystals rarely are found in nature is that natural temperatures fluctuate. Here, they don't. Looking down into the tanks through a glass porthole, we see this. The seed crystals rotating back and forth day and night for eight long weeks as layer after layer of clear and symmetrical crystals build up on the seed. Pretty to look at and very useful too. For these crystals are piezoelectric. If you compress them, they give off electricity. And if you subject them to electricity, they give off sound. Thus the vital purpose they will serve is in sonar equipment used by the Navy for sending and receiving sound underwater. Before they can do this, however, they must undergo extensive additional processing. Like many other crystals, the ADP, as it's called, must be cut by an expert who follows the plane surfaces and thus leaves a minimum of waste. Another part of our story concerns the mushrooming plastics industry, including the polyethylene being manufactured here in New Jersey by the Bakelite Company. While some of the materials we have seen, like the stones, are exact man-made duplicates of natural substances, and others are useful substitutes, most of the plastics are completely new creations, often combining qualities never before found in a single material. And yet the plastics often are given the surface appearance of more familiar things. Sheets of plastic, for example, can be shaped quickly into hats that look like traditional straws. After heat is applied to a synthetic called dynel, it takes only a second or two to shape a hat under pressure. The same mold that shapes the hat imparts a straw-like texture to its surface. Now, little remains to be done except for trimming of waste material and the insertion of the leather band. Other plastics have some of the characteristics of leather, along with a good many more qualities strictly their own. This one covers a collapsible partition in a restaurant. The same material frequently is used in upholstering. Here, the plastic is Duran. Mm -hmm. 
Another home use for the same material and others of this type, a covering for paneled walls. For this application, the surface has been embossed with a grain. Weather balloons are made of other plastics. And still others are used in the production of a variety of fibers. Much of the output goes into clothing, of course, but large amounts are used in floor coverings, too, as here in a plant operated by Mohawk. Careful controls are maintained throughout the processing required to prepare the fibers for use in long-lasting carpeting. And finally, at this point, they're ready to move along to looms which handle them just as they would conventional materials. In carpeting, as in many other products, the use of synthetic materials has inspired a new spirit of competition. Plastics manufacturers have invested heavily to win acceptance of their product. And at the same time, industries that face this new competition have worked hard to meet it constantly improving their own materials. The competition leads to new manufacturing methods too, like the ones developed by Borg Corporation to convert fibers like Dacron, Nylon, and Orlon into synthetic fur. From knitting machines, the fibers emerge as fabric in tubular form. Each tube then is split open for further processing. The material is soft as the finest lambskin which in fact it closely resembles. Originally intended to be used almost entirely in buffers, the fabric has found dozens of other applications in a very few short years. For one thing, synthetic fur turned out to be ideal for paint rollers, since it's impervious to water and chemicals and resists matting. Yes, synthetics have affected our lives in many ways. They help protect us against the weather. And they increase our children's pleasure, giving them new, easy to clean toys. They have even won an honored place in the field of fashion, one of the many fields in which better materials now are widely available at lower cost, because industrial research has learned to copy and to improve on mother nature. American industry, builder of a better tomorrow, has presented Industry on Parade, a service of the National Association of Manufacturers. <laughs>